So with those words of introduction, um, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to the uh, eminent panel I have here on my left. Um, and uh, let them give short presentations. And after that, then we'll have uh, some discussion and, and, and take some questions. Um, so in order, um, we have first up is Professor Lori Blank, who's from Emory University uh, in the US. Now, Lori uh, teaches international humanitarian law. Uh, and she's written and published widely on this issue. So she's a very well-known academic. Uh, within Israel, but also uh, internationally and within the U.S. But she brings also a practical, a wealth of practical experience, which I think is uh, extremely interesting. Uh, she works directly with students to provide assistance to international tribunals, non-government organizations, and law firms around the world on cutting-edge issues in international humanitarian law and human rights. <clears throat> in addition, um, she uh, is a series editor of the ICRC's teaching supplements on IHL, a member of the American Bar Association's Advisory Committee on the Standing Committee on Law and National Security, and a member of the Public Interest Law and Policy Group's high-level working group. Before that, uh, she was a program officer on the Rule of Law program in the U.S. Uh, Institute of Peace. Um, she's directed various expert working groups on this subject. Um, and uh, so without further ado, Laurie, please. Okay. Uh-oh. Um, so I want to thank the ICRC and INSS for inviting me to be here. I'm always very happy to be back in Israel and at the INSS. And uh, it's really a um, pleasure to be here to talk about these issues, even though some of the issues aren't necessarily a, a pleasure. Um, what I want to uh, talk about today is um, obviously the, the legal challenges. That's the title of our panel. And I think one of the, the way I want to approach this is really one of the, the challenges of talking about the law. I think we've, we've heard a bit about the legal framework already today. There are uh, obviously a set of fundamental principles and purposes that guide action uh, in whatever type of combat environment. And when we think about them in the abstract, they, they do appear to be fairly straightforward target only people and objects involved in military action, protect civilians, et cetera. Obviously, they get much more complicated when put into practice. But one of the challenges, I think, is how do we actually talk about it? And how do we talk about these situations? So um, when we think about warfare in densely populated areas, one of the key challenges, obviously, as, as in any situation, is the finding the operational flexibility and opportunity for action that's needed in order to uh, achieve mission goals, mission objectives, and so on. And there are a variety of constraints and frameworks. Obviously, the legal framework provides that overarching parameter for what action is acceptable. Uh, but then there's policy, there's operational constraints, and those are wrapped together with the law. We can't talk about one without the other too much. And when we think about those latter questions, the response of the international community, the national population, uh, are, are quite consequential often. And we end up getting to this question of legitimacy, which has come up already today. And this linkage between law and legitimacy has become really critical in every conversation. Historically, we thought about legitimacy in a different way. We thought about it as just war. Did you have a right to go to war? Was your cause acceptable? Uh, that's changed now. Um, now we think about legitimacy often as in, how did you fight? Did you fight in a lawful manner? Did you fight in a moral manner? And that's become a driving force in how we think about legitimacy. Well, if that's going to be how we think about legitimacy, then understanding the law is essential to how we understand legitimacy. But what about if we look at this the other way? And what does legitimacy tell us about how we think about the law? And I think this is an important flip side of that equation. It's not just, well, let's talk about the law so we understand how much legitimacy there is. But let's understand the legitimacy conversation to make sure that we are then using the law and applying the law as effectively as possible. <clears throat> 
So I, I want to raise a couple of specific issues uh, briefly, and then I know we'll have lots more opportunity in the context of the, of the discussion throughout the panel. Uh, three in particular. One has to do with proportionality and how we talk about it. One has to do with military objectives. And the other has to do with information, which, as we know from earlier panels, is essential to any implementation of the law, of military operations. Without information, you're a bit paralyzed um, in many situations. So the, um, with regard to proportionality, we've talked about what it is, what proportionality means. We understand there's concepts of collateral damage and so on. I want to look at this a little bit in the opposite direction, especially in terms of how we talk about proportionality. When we talk about proportionality, both in the legal discourse and predominantly in the media coverage, in the NGO discussions, we always talk about civilian casualties. That's obviously the essential purpose of proportionality. That's why we have this doctrine, to try to minimize civilian casualties as much as possible. But there's another piece to proportionality, and that's the military advantage. These things go together. Proportionality is not just about how many civilians were harmed. It's about the relationship between those two things. And here, I think we have a lot of work to do about how we talk about military advantage. Civilian casualties are easy to talk about. I mean, it, it's difficult as a concept, but we have numbers. We have amounts of damage. We see pictures. We hear stories, um, difficult stories. We can grasp this as human beings. For those of us who are not in the military um, and those out in the international community, the NGOs, the governments, uh, the UN, et cetera, military advantage is very elusive. Um, and I think a, a more effective conversation about, for example, as, as, uh, as uh, General Efroni mentioned, the private houses. Well, when you talk about a, a private house to somebody who is not uh, really thinking hard about the nature of the military operation, well, they think that must be punitive. Like, why else would you target somebody's private house? What could be the reason? It's a house. It belongs to a family. OK. Well, if you don't think about what the other side is doing, how they're using that house, what the purpose is, what the impact of taking away that opportunity from them is, you're not able to have an effective conversation about military advantage. So I want to. Uh, really introduce that into the conversation that I think we can advance our discussion on these topics. Uh, the same thing goes to the discussion about who is who when we talk about who is being targeted, who is being harmed. Uh, we have concepts in the law about direct participation in hostilities. We have lots of terminology, a combatant. The US has created all kinds of problems with terms like enemy combatant and all sorts of terms that we could be much more simplistic in how we talk about it. Again, if we don't really understand how to distinguish in our language between the different types of people, we certainly are going to have more difficulty distinguishing when we talk about it as a legal concept. Uh, and, and here, I think, with all these questions, we can look at the difference between the perception of what's going on and the reality of what's going on and the gap between an operational perspective and the public's assumptions and the public's understanding, as limited as that may be. And that's where we end up with this significant gap in the discourse. Um, we start to look at proportionality retrospectively instead of prospectively. Once you go down that road, you're, you know, you're like Alice in Wonderland. You're tumbling down the rabbit hole, and I think you'll never come back. So uh, with regard to the second area that I wanted to mention, military objectives, we can raise the same question about communication and discourse with regard to military objectives. Uh, we talked a little bit um, yesterday in some of our discussions about uh, objects that have special protected status, like hospitals and mosques. And they have a protected status for a reason. right? The law does this for a reason. They also lose that status if they're being used for military purposes. Again, how do we communicate about this? What does it mean when a hospital is being used to store weapons versus being used as a command post versus being used to launch rockets from the courtyard? Those have different operational consequences, 
we need to talk about them differently. We can't just say it's being used for military purposes. That doesn't give enough um, uh, specificity about what does that mean and why it's going to be targeted, why it's going to be targeted in a particular way. Uh, we also don't, uh, I think, we could be more uh, effective in talking about the different ways you go about attacking a target. Not everything is designed to destroy. Sometimes we want to neutralize. Sometimes uh, use harassing fire, or capture something. Different purposes are going to have then different effects. The last point I want to mention is the impact of information, especially in today's world of modern technology. Um, it's a different age than it was 15, 20, certainly 30 years ago. And effectively, states have really begun to lose control over the gathering and dissemination of information. This is going on not just by the media, but by everybody, individual people. If you have a cell phone, you are now equal to just about anybody else out there with an, as an information source. Uh, when we think about this, uh, I saw somebody use uh, describe this as essentially trying to take the genie that's come out of the bottle and stuff it back into the bottle, right? You can never do that, right? You have this little bottle, out comes the huge genie. That's the information that's being disseminated. There's no way to put it back. Um, so I think this raises a lot of questions in terms of how implementation of the law is understood, especially in these complex urban environments where so many different information sources are being provided in terms of how do we deal with this? Um, I think these questions raise a lot of questions for the longer term implementation of the law, application of the law, and how we interpret it in future conflicts. And I'll, I'll leave that for the, for the discussion period. So thank you. <laughs>